Thank you very much. Uh, let, me, let me start thanking the organizers uh, for inviting me here and to give me the opportunity to uh, give a lecture on conformal field theories and conformal bootstrap. And also, let me thank the, the students to be here. Um, if, you, if you bear with me for a few lectures, perhaps we're going to get to the point where you can um, understand what is the, the field of conformal bootstrap and perhaps start doing your, your very first computations uh, in this framework. Uh, let, me, let me start giving you a couple of uh, references for, for the course. Uh, so. There are already very nice lectures online that I will be following. Uh, I'm also writing a set of lecture notes for, for specifically for this course, uh, but they are not ready yet. When, uh, whenever they will be ready, they will be posted on the web page. Um, so there are some TASI lectures. by uh, David Simons Duffin. Um, so these are 1602, 07982. Um, there are also some other lecture notes uh, by by Zlavarikov. Um, these two are very introductory, and um, this one is 1601, 05, and then there is a, a shining brand new review on the field uh, by uh, David Poland against Lavarichkov and myself, which basically reviews uh, the theory, the numerical applications, or the physical applications uh, of the last 10 years. So all the developments, uh, all the references are contained in this um, in this, this review, so, and this is 1805.04.405. I'll be um, I will be following uh, these three main references. Everything that I'm going to say is contained here partially. So this lecture will be sort of linear combination of of these three perhaps with some projection, uh, because I don't have time to cover everything. And this, um, this lecture will be organized in a, in, in, in a twofold way. There will be um, many hours of, of lectures where I will cover the basics, and then Starting from tomorrow, uh, one hour per day will be dedicated to sort of mathematical tutorial to uh, get your hand, hands dirty and uh, really managing to, to, to make computation in, in, this, uh, in this field. As you will see, part of the, of, of the conformal bootstrap approach relies on numerical techniques. This doesn't, this doesn't mean that we have to do Monte Carlo simulation or anything. It's not lattice field theory, it's nothing like that. Um, it's just that, as, you will, as we will see, um, some of the equations that we need to solve uh, are very complicated. They are functional equations, but they can be nicely recasted in, in a way uh, which allows you to tackle the feasibility of this equation with numerical techniques. And that's what we're going to do. Uh, so, and to do that, there's a nice software that has been developed over the years. So uh, I will guide you through the, uh, the software and, uh, and the physical consequences that you can obtain from that. But don't be scared. Um, it's mostly 
mathematical notebooks and, and um, you don't have to code anything basically. Right, so let's start. Um, today I would like to spend uh, the first hour trying to motivate why you should be, why you should care about conformal field theories, um, what are the techniques that have been developed over the years to study conformal field theories, and, and what is the philosophy that led us to, to develop a new, a new machinery, a new set of techniques uh, to study these theories. So wh what is, why conformal field theories? Well, from uh, a very down-to-earth perspective, um, conformal field theory naturally arise when you, when you start, when you, in condensed matter systems, for instance, when you try to study uh, transition between different phases. So as you know very well, physical systems can exist in different phases, very much like materials and chemical comp uh, um, mixtures. Uh, they can exist in different phases. For instance, uh, if, you, if you look at the, the phase space of water, which is uh, something I'm sure you're all, you're all familiar with, um, <coughs> in the temperature pressure uh, plane, this, uh, this plane is divided in three, mostly in, in, um, in three regions, something like that. You have the solid phase, uh, liquid phase, and the gas phase. So let me. Okay, and so normally the transition between this, these phases is something very familiar. Uh, you hit a liquid, you get vapor, you hit a solid, you get liquid, and so on. But there is a special point in this plane which happens at a particular uh, value of the temperature and particular value of the pressure, which are called critical temperature, critical pressure, where the system behaves in sort of a very uh, not intuitive way. And the reason is, at this particular point, the correlation length of, which is basically the size over which fluctuations are correla correlated to each other, it diverges. Okay? So there's this quantity, xi, which is called the uh, uh, correlation length, and this goes to, at this particular point, it goes to, in to infinity. What does it mean? It means that all the microscopic degrees of freedom of the theory, they sort of interact among each other at all length scales. Okay? There is no localization of, of interaction. Everything combines sort of in a cohesive way uh, in order to create a very complicated quantum state. And because the correlation length goes to infinity, you might expect that the theory does not have a typical length scale, because the typical length scale is indeed the correlation length. So the, the system in this particular scenario, as t goes to tc, for instance, the, the system loses all the, the typical lengths. And so in a, in a, by definition, it becomes sort of scaling variant. Uh, this means that um, it doesn't matter which length scale, which energy you probe the system, it will behave at, uh, in a very similar fashion. And uh, in the proximity of this, uh, of this point, you might, uh, you might expect that all observables behave in a very, in a very simple way because, because there are no um, length scale. Uh, the, only, um, the only behavior you can expect is a sort of power law behavior. So, um, for instance, the, the correlation length in the proximity of the critical temperature will behave like will scale like the difference between the temperature and the critical temperature to some exponent, which usually in the literature is denoted by nu. And similarly, you can, uh, you can compute other observables, for instance, um, the heat capacity, which is usually called C. This will always also scale as a power of the difference temperature minus critical temperature. And this is usually denoted by 2 minus 3 nu in three dimensions. Sorry. Uh, yeah. 
So this sorry, these exponents here are called critical exponents. Okay, and one question that you might ask is how do we compute these critical exponents? Um, as you may, as you may, you may guess, the system, a very simple system like water in uh, in such a configuration is very complicated. So you might expect that perturbation theory, for instance, doesn't work very well. And this isn't indeed the case. So people over the years invented many different methods to co to compute these observables. Um, so this is one possible uh, scenario where you might be interested in, in a system which is scale invariant. Okay, uh, special point in the transition between two different phases. So this is, uh, if instead you are more high energy oriented person, you might not care too much about condensed matter, and then you might instead uh, be interested more in quantum field theory. And it turns out that. Uh, Conformal field theories are also very important in our understanding of quantum field theory. You might think of any quantum field theory as sort of an RG flow between two different points, the ultraviolet and the infrared. And as you, uh, in the Wilson approach, as you start integrating out shell of momenta, uh, degrees of, or if you want, degrees of freedom, you basically move along this trajectory. And in the, ultra, the ultraviolet and the infrared, uh, these are defined by all ener uh, energies much, much larger than the typical scale of your quantum field theory. And this is energy much, much smaller than the typical scale of your quantum field theory. And so again, these two points the endpoints of energy flow, they are naturally described by theory with, uh, without any scale, okay? Because all the scales do not matter in this, all the scale, the typical length scale of your theory do not matter in these regimes. And so um, the endpoint of any uh, RG flow will be indeed scale invariant. There might be trivial theories or there might be not trivial theories, for instance, uh, what kind of uh, uh, infrared behavior you might expect in a theory? Well, um, well, there are several possibilities. For instance, your theory might be gapped, which means that there are only massive degrees of freedom. And if this is the case, when you go to the infrared, as soon as you pass the threshold of the, the mass threshold, then you don't have enough energy to, produce, to excite any, uh, any quantum state, and so the theory is basically trivial in the infrared. You don't have anything going on. Another possibility instead is that the theory is gapless, and you have... Um, uh, degrees of freedom, which are, uh, which persist all the way down to uh, very low energies. Uh, this is the case, for instance, of photons in QED. Or if you have spontaneous symmetry breaking, then goes to ghost on boson. They are massless if the theory, if the symmetry was exact, and they are der derivatively coupled. So in the infrared, basically they, they do exist, but they have uh, vanishing interaction because all the interactions uh, are proportional to the energy. But still, this is one example. And then a more interesting example is that as you move along the RG flow, at certain point you you hit a fixed point. So uh, a fixed point of the RG flow means that you keep, uh, as you move along the RG flow, you, you modify the Lagrangian by integrating out degrees of freedom, but at a certain point, the modification of, of, of your action 
does not change uh, the physics. Okay, so this is a fixed point of the RG f of the RG flow, and in this case, by definition, the theory is scale invariant. So again, uh, one possible infrared behavior. Well, you can also reverse the logic in the ultraviolet. But, uh, let's let's stick to infrared for for the sake of the argument. One very interesting possibility for uh, infrared behavior is that. Um, at certain point, as you keep modifying your theory and integrating out stuff, um, at certain point you, you hit a value where the action is not modified by your RG transformation. And th so uh, usually in perturbation theory, this is identified by all the beta functions of your theory equal to zero. Okay. So these are all scenarios where um, a scale invariant theory is very important. And it, uh, we, 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 we need to understand how, how to deal with these theories. So how do we deal with these theories? So, so far I have been talking about scale invariance, but as I will argue in a, uh, hopefully uh, today, uh, scale invariance also implies a larger symmetry, uh, which, is which is conformal invariant, and we will see this later, later on. But <coughs> let's, uh, let us uh, continue with this, with this uh, overview of uh, possible methods. And one thing that you should, be, you should note in this uh, in this description is that because um, we are describing, we, we are, for instance, we are interested in uh, infrared behaviors, um, there's a very important concept which is called universality. Which is the statement that um, if you're interested in, a, in an infrared behavior of a theory, it doesn't really matter what, where, the uh, microscopic uh, degrees of freedom of the theory. So uh, if you are interested in some infrared, there might be multiple ultraviolet description that differ only, for instance, in, um, uh, in, in um, details that are suppressed during the RG flow. And so different ultraviolet description can lead to the same uh, infrared behavior. And because of this, um, the same, um, and because of this, we usually talk about universality classes, okay? Uh, different UV, UV behavior can have the same infrared behavior because during the, RG, the, the normalization group flow, all the differences are suppressed. Uh, okay, so for instance, if we want to describe this case, uh, the transition between vapor to liquid, there are many possible uh, UV description that you can provide, and they all they all give the same prediction in the infrared. Of course, they differ uh, at any other uh, in the ultraviolet. They differ in the initial description, but they give you the same infrared behavior. And so people uh, engineer different description in the ultraviolet that provide the same, the same infrared uh, description. So for instance, the water at the critical point can be described in many different ways. It can be described, for instance, as a, um, a set of spins that um, can assume only two behavior, and this is the famous Ising model, or can be described with a um, a field theory approach where you start from, a, from a, a, some field which has a, some quantum fluctuation and then you start doing usual Feynman diagrams description and you end up with, a, you compute the beta function and <coughs> you sort of um, try to compute this critical exponent using a field theory approach. And they, all, uh, they should all agree in the infrared. 
The problem with these approaches is that, um, first of all, they're perturbative or they rely heavily on uh, Monte Carlo simulations if, you, if you're dealing with spins. And they're not very precise. And most importantly, they don't exploit the fact that you want to describe a scale invariant theory. Just to give you a sense of, um, of the prediction that you can get using different techniques. For exactly this, this parameter here. So here I'm reporting two critical exponents for the Isimod for the so-called uh, for this particular case. Uh, the critical exponent nu that I define, and uh, another critical exponent eta, which is basically the critical exponent that regulates how the magnetic susceptibility uh, of the system scales. And uh, you can compute this using uh, epsilon expansion, starting from a phi to the fourth theory in, in formalized epsilon dimensions. And these have some, some very large error bars. I'll, I'm going to put some scales here in a second. Um, so this is 0 0.67, 0 0.634. Uh, this is uh, new, this is eta, 0 0.3, and 0 0.4, okay? So you might think, okay, this is pretty, pretty good. Uh, it's on the, on, the, on, the third, on the second digit in both of them. Um, and then you can compare, for instance, with uh, other techniques for instance, so this is in epsilon expansion in phi to the fourth. Um, you can do some other expansion um, because this system lives in three dimensions. So uh, in, uh, in order to do this computation, you have to do an epsilon expansion that resum the ex epsilon expansion and set epsilon to one. So it's very non-trivial. There are many error bars going on. So you, another thing you can do is start directly in three dimensions and do a Feynman diagram uh, expansion and, uh, um, and, and also resum that because the theory is strongly coupled. So you can get some other prediction, something like that. So this is 3D expansion. And you might compare with the most precise prediction coming from Monte Carlo. And then in that case, you would see that, uh, first of all, that they're not always consistent. And second of all, they have very small error bars. Okay. Um, so you see numerical, numerical techniques here have a, a, a much more powerful than any uh, quantum field theory computation that you might do. And just to tell you, this is like uh, five loops computation. So it's very in intense computation. So from a th theory perspective, you would like to, to do better than, than, this, uh, than this prediction. And the reason why you cannot do better is because we are not, in, in this uh, five-loop computation, we are not exploiting the fact that you, are, that, that you, have a, you, you want to study a scale-invariant fixed point. So the idea, um, instead of starting from a generic, uh, from a generic quantum field theory, uh, compute Feynman diagrams, and then set the beta function to zero, find the Fink's point, uh, perform the RG flow, and all this stuff, why don't we start directly from a theory which is scale invariant and try to, to study this theory from fr first principles? So this is the idea of the bootstrap. The, 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 the idea of the bootstrap is that we don't care about what is the microscopic description of the theory. We just want to study a, th a system which is scale invariant, and uh, as such, it has a very, a very important symmetry, which is scale invariance and conformal invariance. And you want to you want to study it only using the consistency conditions of the theory. So the program is very much like uh, the S matrix bootstrap.
that was developed in the 50s and the 70s, sorry, in the 60s, the 50s and the 60s, where people wanted to under, want to construct the most general S matrix consistent with the, uh, all the constraints of the theory. What are the constraints of a theory for an S matrix? Well, first of all, there is Lorentz invariance. Um, because you want to study Lorentz invariant theory, you, you better impose Lorentz invariance. Then there is unit unitarity, namely probability should be positive, um, norms of states should be positive, and then there is uh, another important constraint which is crossing. Crossing for an S matrix means that if you have Okay, two states colliding, state one, state two, go into state four, three and state four, this should, this should be related somehow to uh, the process where you scatter one and three and you go to two and four, perhaps with some co complex conjugation of states, okay? In states are equivalent to out state. Uh, modular complex conjugation. So this set of constraints are, so, are sort of uh, consistency condition. That you want to impose on an S matrix and try to, to come up with the uh, answers for the S matrix that uh, obey all these all this sort of constraints, and perhaps there, there are only a few solutions that, uh, that are consistent. Unfortunately, this program didn't uh, succeed too, too much back in the days. Now it's been um, resurrected most recently after the conformal bootstrap. Um, <coughs> but we will see that the, the idea is very, is very general, and it can be carried on to conformal field theories. Okay, so the idea of the conformal bootstrap is that to study generic theory, which has all these properties, plus, of course, uh, in, in our case, um, uh, conformal symmetry. Okay. And then, in this case, you cannot talk about S matrices because there are no S matrices. In, uh, in a conformal invariant theory, since you cannot define in and out states. Um, but the idea is very, is very general. And imposing imposing a consistency condition coming from this requirement will allow, the, allow us to, in some cases, to solve exactly the theory, in some other cases to uh, establish important um, consequences. Okay, so this was a sort of generic introduction and motivation for this approach. Uh, now let's start with uh, the actual content. As I said, um, let me just stress to you also that the approach that I'm going to present works in any dimension, larger than two, if you want. It also works in one dimension, but it's sort of trivial. Uh, in two dimension, conformal field theory, as you might have seen from your string theory course, is very powerful. And in that case, because you have additional symmetries, which is the Virasoro algebra, uh, you might have more power than what I'm going to present. But everything that I'm going to say also applies to two dimensions. And uh, in addition, um, the philosophy of the conformal bootstrap, because only relies on consistency condition, does not require the existence of 
a Lagrangian formulation for your theory. As you will see, we will talk about only observables and operators. Uh, we will never refer to an, a specific Lagrangian. So uh, a very important um, uh, property of, of this technique is, is that you don't need a Lagrangian to exist. What does it mean? It means that you might, um, you might even study theories that you don't know how to describe in terms of the Lagrangian. And there are many theories, uh, especially in, th in string theory, that have this property, okay? Yes, so where you can, you can give, for instance, a construction in terms of brains in high dimension, then you compactify the, extrema the uh, extra dimension, you go, you go down to four dimension, and you end up with some theory and you don't have a Lagrangian description for that, simply because you cannot identify the uh, relevant degrees of freedom. But nevertheless, you know that the theory exists for, because there is a construction for it, and you know you might uh, argue that it's conformal, and with this approach, you, might also you, you, you will be able to study these theories as well. Okay. So let's start with, uh, with a few considerations. Um, because we are interested in, uh, in scale invariant theories, uh, scale invariance means that um, if you perform an, um, an RG transformation and you send your coordinate to uh, coordinate X prime, which is related to the original one by a rescaling, or equivalently, you rescale your metric of the space time. Uh, with, uh, with uh, the square of the same rescaling, the theory should be invariant. Okay? Um, if you have an action for this theory, this statement, so invariance under under this transformation, implies uh, that the action, that the variation of the action uh, which is equal, you can write in terms of the energy moment of the energy momentum tensor, um, like integral in ddx of t mu nu, delta mu nu, delta g mu nu. This has to be zero. Okay, yes? <coughs> yes, definitely. So, for instance, a very interesting example of non Lagrangian description is n equal 3 uh, super conformal field theories in four dimensions. Okay. Uh, for n equal 4, we do have the Lagrangian, for instance. But for n equal 3, you can show that any Lagrangian description that has n equal 3 super conformal symmetry will also have n equal 4 because there are some conserved currents. Uh, <coughs> but if you really want to study n equal 3, then you don't, we don't have a single example of a theory which has a Lagrangian description. They only construct in terms of brains. But nevertheless, people manage to study using the technique that I'm going to present, uh, this, this class of theories. So there is a whole parallel to what I'm going to say in supersymmetry. Uh, n equal 1, equal n equal 2, uh, n equal whatever. Okay. Um, superconformal, superconformal bootstrap is a sta sort of standalone uh, field, uh, field, but it relies on whatever I'm going, I'm going to say. So the difference from what I'm going to say and what uh, is needed in, and super in superconformal bootstrap is just adding supersymmetry to what I'm going to say. Yes. Right. I'll, I'll explain that. Um, it's basically crossing, it basically translates into associativity of, operator, uh, of the operator algebra. But I'll explain that. It's one of the main points. Okay. Um, very good. So we have this requirement, and of course, in this particular simple case, delta, delta g mu is proportional to g mu itself, and so the invariance under scale transformation implies that the trace of the energy moment, the integral of the trace of the energy momentum tensor has to be zero. So 
this by itself does not imply that the trace of the energy momentum tensor has to be zero because it could be uh, it could be that the trace of the energy momentum tensor is equal to some gradient of some vector okay and uh, uh, if this is the case, then the trace of the energy momentum tensor is not zero. However, um, if, you if you look at this, uh, at this equation for a second, you will convince that yourself that it's very hard to realize this, uh, this condition with k, uh, with, a, with a non conserved k. Okay? The reason is uh, the dimension of the stress, energy, the, the stress tensor is the canonical one. So that this dimension of t mu nu in all dimension is equal to the space-time dimension. And so this k, this implies that k, if it exists, it should have d minus 1 dimension. But um, usually, at least in conformal field theory, we will see that this condition implies that uh, k mu is conserve itself. And so um, this, tra this, uh, this, this contraction should, should give you zero. Uh, if it's not conserved, then generically it will take, uh, and it will get an anomalous dimension around the RG flow, and so you, can, you simply don't have candidates to write this equality. So generically, I'm not, I'm not giving a proof here, but generically you don't have candidates to write such, um, such relation, and, which so and this implies that T mu mu In two and four dimension, there is actually a proof of this. Um, in higher dimension, uh, or in different dimension, there is no such, such a formal proof, but there is no a single example of a theory which is unitary and fulfill this, con this, uh, this condition. So in a sense, this, the, this, if this is true with the, non with the non conserved K, this would be called scale but not conformal invariant theory. And we don't have a single example of a of a non uh, of a unitary scale, but not conformal invariant. So, for the rest of the of the lecture, we'll assume that uh, invariance under the RG flow implies that the trace the trace of the, the stress tensor is actually zero. Okay. <coughs> so, because of this relation. Uh, we see that uh, the th a theory which has uh, zero trace of the energy momentum tensor is actually invariant under a larger set of transformation, which are called uh, vile transformations. So. T mu mu equal to zero implies uh, invariance. under this infinitesimal by transformation. Which are those transformations where you take the matrix, G mu nu, and you send it to uh, um, the metric itself times coordinate dependent factor, which I will write like this, lambda square uh, g mu, where uh, lambda now can depend on x, okay? And uh, this is a, and you have to think that this is infinitesimal, because if it's not infinitesimal, there could be anomalies, uh, as you, you were discussing in, the, in your previ previous lecture. And so we don't want, I don't want to enter in, in that, uh, in the discussion, because on the only thing that we will need are infinitesimal wide transformation. Now, if you if you perform a wide transformation, you're actually changing the space time. You're sending this is not a coordinate transformation generically. It will it can send a flat space to curved space, and this is not something you want. Okay, you don't want to study theories in some curved background, at least for now. But there is a subset of this transformation that actually correspond to um, 
a change of coordinates. And these are the so-called conformal transformation. So conformal transformations are those distal morphism Um, x prime x going to x prime, uh, which is x plus some function epsilon of x at infinitesimal level, uh, <coughs> such that the metric which normally transforms uh, like this, g mu nu. Uh, let me take the g minus prime of x prime. Normally, it transforms like with the Jacobian. So dx rho over dx prime mu, dx sigma, sorry, index up, d um, x prime nu g uh, rho sigma so this is the usual uh, transformation under diffeomorphism um, you want this to be a vital transformation so you want this to be some uh, lambda square g mu nu okay so there is a subset of um, diffeomorphism or if you want, there, there's a subset of Vi transformations that can be written as a diffeomorphism. And when this is the case, you're not changing the geometry of, of your space-time because it's a, it's, a it's a diffeomorphism. So conformal transformation are those subset of, of Vi transformation that uh, fulfill this uh, requirement. Okay. The nice thing of this is that, um, as I said, they don't, they don't really alter the spa your, your space-time. So it's important to consider what they are. And so how do we find the exact form of this transformation? Well, what we have to do is to expand um, to make an infinitesimal transformation and see what kind of constraints do we get out of that of that equation. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to consider. Um, I will expand in epsilon. So I will consider epsilon uh, small infinitesimal transformation at, at the same time. I uh, will uh, consider lambda also small. So lambda is going to be 1 plus um, order epsilon, or the epsilon squared, sorry. Sorry, lambda is 1 plus, OK. <coughs> and then I will expand this, uh, this equation and see what I get. Um, so if I do that, uh, I get a very simple equation of the following form. D, d rho epsilon mu plus the mu epsilon rho this has to be equal to 2 over d um, the sigma epsilon sigma g mu rho. Okay, so this is a constraint that follows directly from this equation. And then, by massaging a little bit this, uh, this equation, we can get, so you see this is a differential equation for, for epsilon. And, and so we can, the, the idea is that by massaging a little bit this equation, we can get uh, what are the allowed values for epsilon. Um, so what can we do? 
Well, the first, the first point is to get, um, to take another derivative of this, of this equation. And so I get something like this. The mu, the new epsilon rho plus d rho d nu epsilon mu. This has to be equal to the new, the sigma epsilon sigma, Jimmy Rho. And you can also, so this is one equation which simply the previous one where I, I took another derivative. And then you can um, reshuffle a little bit the indices. Um, basically, you can symmetrize the indices and then sum them, sum the three equations. Okay. You, can, um, you can exchange mu with nu, for instance. You get another equation, or you can exchange um, rho with nu. And you get a, another equation, and then you can sum them in order to um, extract, for instance, the first term. And so from here, you get that the mu the new epsilon rho can be written as 1 over d, where d is the space-time dimension, the new the sigma epsilon sigma, Jimmy rho, minus um, the one we exchange new with rho, plus the one where you exchange uh, sorry um, sorry Ex minus the one where you exchange mu and nu and, and plus the one where you exchange mu with rho and so we ma we managed to find well this is still a very complicated differential equation but it allows us to understand what, uh, what well, st we start understanding what's going on. And now let's construct, for instance, the, the first two indices, and we get a very nice differential equation. We get that box of um, epsilon mu is equal to 2 minus d over d the mu of um, the sigma ep the sigma epsilon sigma is much simpler and from this equation you see already that something special is going on in two dimensions because when d is equal to 2, uh, the constraint is that uh, epsilon mu has to be, uh, has to satisfy a sort of Klein Gordon equ uh, Laplace equation. Okay, so in, in 2D, the any epsilon sa that satisfies uh, box epsilon equal to 2 will do. But we are interested in general dimensions, so let's stay away from, for, for, from this special case, and let's go on. Um, so what I'm going to do now is to <coughs> take a further derivative. Uh, I'm, I'm, I promise I'm going to converge very soon. So uh, if I take another derivative, okay, uh, this is 2 minus d over d. the mu, the nu, the sigma, epsilon sigma, okay? And similarly, you can exchange, you can take another one where you exchange mu with nu. And then, by summing them, you get that 2 minus d of the mu, the nu, of this quantity, the sigma epsilon sigma has to be equal to Jimmy nu box. Okay. Um, so 
flux of the sigma epsilon sigma. And finally, uh, if I take the trace, okay, if I take the trace over the mu, mu nu indices, I finally find that d minus 1 of box of um, this combination the, the sigma epsilon sigma which I will will denote f of x um, has to be zero okay so very good So if you now insert this constraint back here, okay, you plug this back in this equation, you obtain a very important constraint for for the for f, which means that the mu the new f of x has to be zero if you are away from two from two and one dimension. And this is very powerful because it's telling you that if you take two derivatives of f uh, with any possible index, index mu and nu, you have to have, you, you have to get zero. So this implies that f of x can only be at most um, a quadratic function. Sorry, uh, a linear function of of the coordinate. So f of x can only be a plus b mu x mu. Okay, right. So uh, all this, all this um, massaging was to obtain this uh, powerful constraint. Conformal symmetry are those transformation for which uh, this this combination, the sigma epsilon sigma, is at most linear in the coordinate, which implies that that epsilon can be at most quadratic. Yes. Uh, no, no, no. Jimmy New for me is the uh, is, is is the flat matrix. Yeah, sorry, I I should have I should have said it before. Um, Jimmy New is the flat matrix. Is eta mu? Otherwise, the when I take derivative, there should be derivative acting on 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 the matrix. Lambda is local. Lambda is local. So we are we are making vial transformation around the flat background. And we want this this vital transformation to be a diffeomorphism around this uh, this matrix. Okay, so um, fol uh, it follows from. From the from the box constraint there, that epsilon mu can only be at most quadratic in the coordinate. So that when you take the f the divergence, it's at most linear. So I can parameterize this as some integration func uh, c mu, which is a constant, plus uh, some antisymmetric tensor a mu nu. Um, x new plus um, um, another three index tensor mu, mu, mu new rho x new x rho okay a and b are, are not the same as before of course sorry this is um Okay, so this is uh, so uh, so far. A menu is uh, a menu here is not doesn't have any properties yet. Uh, no symmetry property yet. Okay, so now what you can do you can plug this back in uh, our equations, 
And you can show that, for instance, a mu nu can, can, can split into uh, a symmetric part and an antisymmetric part. And you can show that the symmetric part has to be proportional to G, to G mu nu itself. So uh, while the antisymmetric part is totally unconstrained, And also, by plugging this, um, these ansatz into uh, in the, okay, I erase it, in the, original, in the original equation that I had, you can also show that B, which is, a, in principle, a three-symmetric tensor, a three-index symmetric tensor, can, can actually be parameterized in terms of a single vector. And it has this form. Let me, just, let me just write it. So you can show that B mu nu raw can be written as a single vector because it has to satisfy this. 1 over d, b sigma, sigma nu, g mu rho, uh, plus b sigma, sigma rho, uh, g mu nu, minus, sorry, it's the same sigma. B sigma sigma mu genero. Okay, so it is in fact parameterized by a single vector, which is this. Let me call it B, B nu hat. So bottom line is that um, our apps, our diffeomorphism epsilon mu can only be one of the four possi possibilities. It can be a constant, C mu, and this uh, corresponds to translations. And if you shift x prime, if you shift x with a, co with a constant, this is just a translation. Um, you, can you can shift x with something proportional to G mu nu, which means that um, sorry, Jimmy new X. So um, this is going to be something like a X mu, and this is simply a dilatation. Um, or you can shift by. An antisymmetric matrix contracted with X. Let me call this uh, omega mu nu. X nu. And these are just Lorentz transformation or rotations if you are in Euclidean. Or there is a fourth possibility, which is slightly more uh, complicated, which is uh, two b hat mu x. Um, sorry, b hat rho x rho x mu minus x square uh, b hat mu. So this is a new, new set of transformation that uh, you probably are not familiar with, and these are called special, special conformal 
transformation. And in the old literature, these were called conformal boosts. So any of, of this transformation will end up in simply into a scaling of, uh, of the metric. And these are the set of conformal transformation. So let's count, for instance, the parameters. Uh, these are D. These are D, D minus 1 over, over 2. Uh, this is 1. And these are again D. So in a total, there are only d plus 1, d plus 2, over 2 parameters. Okay. So by impo let me summarize what we did by imposing that um, the diffeomorphism can be written as a Weyl transformation. We have found what is the most general, ara sorry, around, let me stress that this was around the flat background. We have obtained the most general transformation consistent with this condition. And this is made of the usual Poincare group, translation plus uh, combined with Lorentz transformation. But there are n new uh, transformations, which are dilatations and special conformal transformation. And we will inspect the consequences of, of this in the next hour. So I'll, uh, I think I'm going to take a little break. It's not one. It's, uh, it's an anti-symmetric. Uh, these are the gen yeah. This is corresponds to the generator. Ah, sorry, I, the one is not, uh, ah, um, of course it was the, the other way. Thank you very much. Sorry. Okay, let's take 10 minutes break. Okay, let's, let's continue. Um, we have identified uh, the set of transformation that corresponds to a conformal transformation. Now, uh, very much like in, uh, for the Lorentz group, for the Poincare group, we have generators associated to this transformation. We would like to identify what are the generators uh, associated to, to this transformation, to the conformal transformation, and work out the algebra of the conformal group. So a very simple way to do that is simply to, uh, to implement this transformation on functions and find out what are the differential operators that generate this transformation. So uh, so this is, a, this is a one way to do that. There are many other ways. So we're going to start from, we have um, the, our coordinate, and then we change the coordinate by x plus um, epsilon of x. And if, if you have a function of f under this transformation, this function will be mapped to f, pri f prime of x prime, um, <coughs> which is defined to be, so let me call this, uh, Psi of x. Uh, f prime of x prime will be f of psi to the minus one of x of x, uh, of x prime. Okay, and um, you can expand this function uh, in terms of x and. Um, you want to you want to uh, you will identify this transformation as generated by some differential operator that I will um, call like this. So f of x 
can be written as e to the minus j, so minus capital G, g is a generator acting of f of x. So you could do that. Um, you can find the explicit form of, of these generators. So uh, not surprisingly, for instance, the generator of translations, p mu, Um, is, gen uh, is implemented by minus i, sorry, in this notation, this is simply uh, minus d mu. Sorry, let, let, me, let me put an i, because otherwise I'd, I'm not consistent with my notation. Okay, uh, the generator of Lorentz And menu, uh, so which is the one that implements the Lorentz transformation, can be written as i um, x mu d nu minus x nu d mu. The generator of dilatation d can be written as minus i x mu d nu. And the generator of the special conformal transformation will be denoted by, so special conformal transformation will be denoted by k mu, is a vector. And it also has a, a very simple form, minus i, 2x mu x rho d rho, minus x square d mu. So this is the differential uh, implementation of the of the generator on functions for in, of coordinates, and then using this explicit form, you can work. We can work out the algebra of the different of the generators. I invite you to do this exercise. I will not do it on the blackboard because the probability that I do some mistake is like one. So let me just write let me let me just write the non-vanishing commutation relations, um, and let me also rescale the generators uh, to get rid of these i's minus i g. Okay, I will rescale the generators so that we don't have i floating around. So if we do that, then um, there is the usual um, Poincaré commutation relations, um, which I'm not going to write. You, you should know them very well. M e nu, M rho, rho sigma. This will be um, eta, what is it? Eta nu rho, M. mu sigma plus permutations. Uh, to remember, these, uh, these are anti-symmetric. Uh, they have uh, anti-symmetric properties. There is a commutation relation between m mu nu and p rho, which simply tells you that p is a vector under Lorentz transformation. Uh, where is it? eta nu rho p mu minus eta mu rho p nu. There is a similar commutation relation between m mu nu and k rho, which also tells you that um, k is a vector, so it's uh, precisely as, the, as the, the previous one, well, except that you now replace p with, with k. Okay, so these are s sort of trivial ones. And then the, 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 
The more important ones are the competition relation between the new, uh, set, of the new set of generators. And among them, we have a competition relation between D and P, which is equal to P. We have a commutation relation between D and K, which is equal to minus K. Notice this minus sign, which is very important. And then finally, the algebra closes uh, also when you consider P mu, sorry, K mu, P mu, to the commutation relation of uh, special conformal transformation generator and the translation generator is gives you back twice the dilatation minus a rotation. Okay, so this is the algebra of the conformal group, um, and it's very. It's straight straightforward to show that this algebra is, can be identified with uh, uh, so d plus one comma one in Euclidean space or uh, so d comma two in in Lorentz and in in Euclidean signature or in Lorentzian signature. Okay, depending on if you perform a, a weak rotation, you can pass from one to the other. And the way to do that is to redefine uh, slightly the generators. So we can, let me introduce a capital letter that goes from one to uh, d plus two, okay, and um, mu instead, Greek letters will go from one to d, and then let me identify, let me define some new generator, j d plus one mu, this will be simply P mu minus K mu over two. Uh, J D plus two mu would be instead the other combination. P mu plus K mu over two. And then uh, J mu nu is M mu nu and J um, D plus one D plus two is gonna be D okay. and with the set of genera um, now we have these J A B generators which are anti-symmetric So you can count that the number of generator is exactly d plus one, d plus two over two. And if you tr you can translate the commutation relation that we had in terms of the new generator, and they look uh, very simple in this in this new basis. So G A B G C D is going to be um, basically is going to be this commutation relation where you substitute Greek letters with capital uh, letters, ca capital Latin letters. So eta B C, J A D. Uh, there are other three terms. Eta A C, J B D, plus eta b d j a c minus eta a d j c b 
where eta here, uh, eta is the metric, is the flat matrix on R d plus one, one. If we are in, if we are in Euclid, otherwise would be the matrix on R d comma two. Okay, so this is the the usual Lorentz matrix if you want in this high dimensional space. So um, this is a just identification, um, but w as we will see uh, this afternoon, it has a, a much much deeper uh, meaning because we can view conformal transformation, which are very complicated. They are they are nonlinear in the coordinates, as you will see. Uh, they can be mapped in a higher dimensional space to uh, rotations, which are sort which are linear transformation. And so working in with this with this set of with set of coordinates on R D plus one comma one uh, is gonna simplify a lot of things. Okay. Questions about this? So um so far we have been um we have been talking about uh, coordinates and uh um I haven't, I haven't talked about states or, or operators at all. So now, now let's start to uh, understand a little bit what are, how uh, representation of this, uh, of this conformal algebra are made. And a nice step to, a nice observation to do before going to, uh, to this kind of, of discussion is to stare for a second to th at this uh, um, commutation relation. You see from in particular, these two, uh, they, they tell you that the generator P and the generator K, they act as um, raising and lowering operate, uh, operators for the, the dilatation, oper for dilatation operator. And this is very simple. Suppose you have uh, now a Hilbert state where you have implemented your conformal symmetry then uh, all the states will be classified in terms of a reducible representation of this algebra. We, we would like to understand how this reducible representation uh, look like. So, um, as reducible representation of the conformal algebra can be of different kinds. There are finite dimensional representations and there are infinite dimensional representations. Um, because the, 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 the group is non-compact, in order for the representation to be unitary, it has to be uh, infinite dimensional, first of all. Uh, very much like the Lorentz, the Lorentz uh, symmetry. So we're gonna focus on uh, infinite, infinite dimensional irreducible representations. And second of all, uh, we're gonna only restrict ourselves to high state irrep. Meaning that uh, you will see this, uh, wh wh what this means in a, se in a second. So suppose we have a state, uh, psi, which has some uh, which, ha which is uh, an eigenstate of the dilatation operator, okay? This means that when I act with the generator D, this gives me back delta times the state itself. And then I would like to ask myself what happens when I, uh, when I act with the other uh, generators. Um, for concreteness, let me also specify some other quantum numbers of this, of this state. For instance, the, the, the quantum numbers under, uh, under rotations. 
So I will, let me add some other quantum numbers here, uh, S, corresponding to the spin. So depending on which dimension we are, the Lorentz transformation ha can have different, more or less complicated representation. For instance, in three dimension, they're only, they're uniquely identified by a single number. In four dimension, you need two number, J1 and J2, which are the two SO2, uh, SU2 uh, uh, indices, and so on and so forth. So let me collectively call S the Lorentz quantum number. in the dimension. Okay? And then, um, because um, I notice that D, the, 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 uh, the dilatation operator and the, uh, the Lorentz uh, generators commute, because the, I only wrote the non, the non vanishing commutation relation, so in particular, m u nu d is equal to zero, which tells you that the dilatation is a scalar under uh, Lorentz transformation. And so in because these two commute, I can di diagonalize them together. So that's what I'm, I'm doing. I'm diagonalizing the dilatation operator and the Lorentz generator together. And I will call this basis uh, delta I, the state delta S. And so the action of the dilatation operator gives me back uh, the state with uh, the eigenvalue eigen in front. Okay. So <coughs> what happens now if I act with another generator? So if I act, if I call the generator, the generator P mu acting on the state, um, Two things happen. First of all, um, it generates a state with a different dimension, and in particular, it generates a state with dimension one unit larger, and it also uh, changes the spin because I'm adding, uh, if you want, I'm adding. Um, uh, an index here. Well, if you want to be more precise, let's contract with some polarization, CMU, so that we, we don't have uh, indices floating around, okay? So uh, acting with the, with the momentum generator, with the translation generator changes the dimension. And why so? Well, simply because if I now act with D on P mu delta S, and I, I can use the commutation relations, um, dp, I can write as pd plus p and so when, when d hit delta, it gives me, uh, uh, hit the state, it gives me the in value, and then uh, this is delta plus one, delta uh, p, u, delta s. So by acting with the translation, I increase the dimension. And similarly, I act with the, uh, uh, with the, with, the with the special conformal transformation generator K, I decrease the dimension because of the minus sign that was present in the commutation relation. So the action of K gives me uh, a state which has delta minus one and generically different spin. Okay, so that's what I meant before. Uh, the, the translation and the special conformal transformation, they act as raising and lowering op uh, operators for the, dimension, for the dimension of the state. And so you can imagine 
the, to iterate this procedure, and you can go as high or as low as you can. As you can. Uh, so generically, this if I don't impose any constraint on my representation, this uh, an irreducible representation of the conformal algebra will be uh, infinite. Uh, will contain infinite operator with um, arbitrary high and arbitrary low dimension. So the, the constraint of highest state representation, irreducible representation, is a constraint that uh, tells us that at some point the lowering, the action of, of K should, should terminate. And the reason for this is twofold. As we will see, uh, the dilatation operator will acquire a physical meaning of a, a sort of Hamiltonian. And so you don't want your Hamiltonian to be unbounded from below. So uh, you want the Hamiltonian to have a lowest, a lowest energy state. So you want this uh, uh, the step of decreasing the dimension to terminate at some point. That's one reason. Another reason is that, as we will see in a, uh, in a lecture or two, operators with arbitrary uh, low dimension have negative norm, or contains at least negative norm states in their irreducible representation. So we don't want delta to go to minus infinity. We want, it, we want to terminate. We want this procedure of reducing the, the dimension to terminate at some point. And so what we're going to do, we're going to simply restrict our attention oops, to a reducible representation for which, at some point, the act k simply gives you 0. So we restrict. to erase that. Uh, it exists a state. Let me call it delta, delta min S, such that when I act with k mu on delta min s, I simply get 0. When uh, um, such a state exists, this is called a primary state. And all the other states contained in the reducible representation can be obtained starting from the primary state and acting with the translation operator. So all the other states, so in conclusion, our irreps will be made out of a lowest dimensional state, which is called the primary, and then an infinite tower of equally spaced operator in dimension. So this will, this will be delta plus 1, delta plus 2, and so on and so forth. And we can pass from one to the other by acting with k and p. So this will be the structure of an irreducible representation of, of Lorentz, of the conformal group. Um, we have a primary state, and we have an infinite tower. This tower goes forever. We are not putting any restriction uh, on the dimension of the state contained in this, uh, on this, in this representation from above, only from, from, from below. And in, in two dimensions, uh, Representation of the full conformal group are more complicated because also uh, consider the Virasoro uh, algebra. So in that in that case, you will you will be considering uh, irreducible representation of the Virasoro um, of Virasoro, and what you call primary there 
uh, are not what are called primary here. Uh, this primary state in, in the dimension are called quasi-primary. And in, um, in 2D. And just to make, a, um, to make it clearer, an irreducible representation of Virasoro can contain, well, not can, will contain infinitely many representation of, of the global conformal group, which is this one. So a quasi-primary can be a Virasoro descendant of a, of a primary in, in two dimensions. And another observation that I would like to make is that these highest states here are called the standards. to here, and if the primary state has some, belongs to some irreducible representation of the Lorentz group, the, the standard do not belong to the same representation, okay? They can belong to uh, co different representation obtained by acting with P. So for instance, when you act with P on a state, on, on a scalar state, you, you get a vector state, for instance. Then you act, you act twice, you get a tensor, and you can get back a scalar as well. So there is this composition of, of irreducible representation, which is basically obtained by decomposing. Uh, so if you have, let's say, just to make an example. Oh, sorry. The mu of delta uh, in three dimensions. Um, the we have rotations, or if you are in Euclidean three dimension, it doesn't change anything uh, if I consider Lorentz. And then in that case, uh, irreducible representation of rotation are just one number, so I can take a state delta uh, s, s here is the spin of the SO3 representation, and then I act with uh, p mu, I can get a state with delta plus one and then s plus one, or a state with delta plus one and s minus one, right? And so on and so forth. If you act twice, you can get uh, a tensor, or a scalar, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, if this is not possible, if s was zero, for instance, then you don't have this state. I guess I still have 15 minutes. Okay, so I, instead of discussing representation on, on operators, let, my, let me conclude with something really light, which is uh, what are this discussion of what are these transformation in, in practice, okay? So these transformations, the conformal transformation Our transformation that, as, I, as we said, preserve the, the metric up to our scaling. So in particular, they preserve angles. Or, right, uh, if you have two vectors that are orthogonal, meaning that the ds square is equal to zero, then you will send the metric into a multiple of itself, so ds square uh, is also zero. So if you have a grid, some Cartesian coordinate, for instance, and you perform a transformation, a conformal transformation, you can you can play with the with this uh, with Mathematica, and you can see that this is sent to, for instance, something like this. Well. 
really bad at drawing. Well, now uh, the intersection are all again are all orthogonal. Uh, they should be orthogonal. Okay. So if this was uh, pi over two, this is also pi over two. Okay. So in particular, for instance, you can find conformal. Uh, this is this case here is a, a special conformal transformation. Of course, uh, uh, dilatation is just dilatation. Translation and rotation are very intuitive. This is mostly the, the non-intuitive one. And for instance, you can you can find conformal transformation that send a circle into a line, and vice versa. Okay, so you can kind of open things. So you can ask, for instance, are the invariant under conformal transformation that you can construct when you have a set of coordinates. This, will, this discussion will come handy uh, next time. So, um, something you can show is that if you have three points, x1, 2, and 3, in space time, you can always use the conformal transformation to send them to special points. So you can send, for instance, x1 to 0, x2 to, uh, well, this is 0 vector, OK, to, uh, I don't know, 0. Zero, uh, 0, 1, and x3, for instance, can be 0, 0, infinity. So you can send 1 to infinity, you can set 1 to the point, to, to some uh, unit vector in some direction, and the 1 to 0. Well, this is very simple, it's just translation, then uh, you can rotate uh, to one of the direction, and, and rescale in order to bring it to one, and then you can you can use a conformal uh, conformal transformation to send one of the uh, to infinity. And basically, this is equivalent to this statement because when you open a circle to a line, you're sending one of the point to infinity. Um, <coughs> Notice that when, whenever you do such a thing, uh, there is some um, some residual symmetry left. In order to perform this 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 change uh, of of this, if you want, this is a sort of a gauge fixing. Uh, this is a gauge fixing of the conformal symmetry. Uh, but when I do this uh, this fixing, I'm not exhausting all the symmetries. There is still um, some residual um, residual symmetry left, which in this case is just S O D minus one. There is a, if you want the, the stabilizer group of this three point, is um, S O D minus one. Namely, there is a, a residual set of symmetries belonging to SOD minus 1, which leave these three points unchanged, untouched. Okay? Um, mo more interesting stuff happens when you have more than three points. Because when you have more than three points, you cannot fix them altogether. There is, sim there is some arbitrariness uh, left. And this is because um, you can construct invariants out of four coordinates. So let's assume we have x1, 2, 3, and 4. Okay? Out of four points, you can construct um, two invariants. 
and a simple exercise is to try to guess this invariant. First of all, because of translation, the only inv uh, invariant must be difference of coordinates. So uh, let's say x w xi, x1 minus x2, or, or similar things. Um, but then, uh, because of dilatation, you must take ratios. So you, you, might, you might think that x1 is x2 uh, divided by, I don't know, uh, x1 minus x3 is a good invariant. But it turns out that this quantity here, despite is uh, invariant under uh, translation, rotation because it's a modulus, uh, dilatation because it's a ratio, is not this quantity here still is not invariant under special conformal transformation. And so uh, the good, it turns out that good um, combination is actually the following. So x12 square, x3 minus x4 square, divided by x1 minus x3 square, x2 minus x4 square. This is one and is usually called u. And there is a similar one, so there is another one, v, which is, uh, let me, in shorthand notation, this is x1, 4, let me define xij equal to xi minus xj. So x1, 4 square, x2, 3 square, divided by x1, 3 square, x2, 4. These are, of course, are conventions. I could, I could take any combination of these two and it will still be an, an invariant. Uh, this quantity here are called cross ratios. And they will be important in the discussion of uh, four point functions. Um, now, One thing that, um, so these are invariant. So um, it means that you cannot, s you cannot set them to arbitrary values, uh, uh, but just by using formal transformations. And it turns out that they have a very simple meaning uh, in terms of the original coordinate. Mm. So if I define the following quantities, I will define ZZ bar like this, implicitly in terms of U and V. Okay. Uh, notice that in um, in Euclidean, Z bar is literally the complex conjugate of Z while in Lorentzian um, Z and Z bar are, are real and independent. Okay. Euclidean are complex, conjugate, and in Lorentz and they're really independent, and they have a very nice uh, interpretation in terms of the original coordinate, as I was saying, um, because now that you have four points, you can fix the three of them as we did before, and then the fourth one uh, will contain information uh, about U and V or ZZ bar in a very simple way. So if uh, given four points, um, <coughs> let's say in you can fix one in zero, you can fix one at so here I'll put like x3, this is one, x4 I'll send it to infinity, as I did before, and then um, because of th because this is a line, 
um, there is always a, a, a plane passing through this line and the fourth point. So I will I'm drawing that plane, and uh, in in that plane the point x2 will be long, well, will be will be represented as a point, and this point is basically uh, z. Okay, so x in this in this coordinate. Uh, Z in the this is a complex pl complex plane Z. Okay. Okay. I'll, I'll I'll stop here for now, and if there are questions, otherwise we'll see this afternoon. <laughs>